It's like waving a red flag. <laughs> Hi, we'd like to welcome everyone tonight to uh, Ask CDI. We're here tonight to uh, chat about how to access uh, child and youth mental health services during COVID-19. My name is Lynn Ryan McKenzie and I'm the CEO at the Child Development Institute. And I'm really pleased this evening to have my friend and colleague, David Willis from uh, Mental Health TO. Welcome, David. Thanks, I'm really happy to be here. So uh, before we get started, we would like to um, recognize um, the, the Child Development Institute as well as Mental Health TO, uh, that we acknowledge that the land on which we work is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, the Wendat, and the Métis people. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13, with the Mississaugas of the Credit. Our community is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit and Métis peoples. And we recognize the enduring presence of indigenous people on this land. So um, with, with that and in that context, uh, we're really um, happy to share some tonight about uh, how to access services um, in, in our city. And the Child Development um, Center is one of about um, almost 30 children's mental health agencies that serve child and uh, children and youth, infants, um, young adults, and in the Toronto area. And some of us, um, like the Child Development Institute, have fairly specialized services that we provide, and others have residential programs. Uh, there's others that have walk-in services and, and a whole range. And many, many of our organizations, the sister agencies, as I like to think of them, um, have uh, a variety of, of different services and cover different parts of the, the city. And so um, one of the most important things for people to know, for families to know and for youth to know, is that our services um, in this pandemic are continuing to be delivered. And so although uh, many of the services have uh, been closed for direct face-to-face -face service delivery during the pandemic up to this point, um, we have pivoted as a, as a sector and are delivering services in uh, new ways through uh, telephone and video conferencing and other ways of connecting with families and continuing to provide supports. Um, and so, um, CDI continues to uh, not only deliver services, but to uh, do intakes and to uh, provide services in the community. And um, we have a very strong partnership with Mental Health TO, and they have a role in the community that I'd um, like for David to talk about. Over to me, is that what we're doing now? I guess so. <laughs> Thanks, Lynn. I think you know what what I what I'd probably like to start off with, and and for um, for the folks who are just jumping on, of course, Lynn and I are talking about children's mental health in the city, and and I think one of the big things is, you know, during COVID nineteen, how do kids get connected to service, right? And so, um, when we talk about the city of Toronto, and Lynn, you can cut me off if I ramble too much on this stuff, but I think setting a bit of context is sometimes helpful and we think about the city yeah. of Toronto and how big it is right and you know if you if you include the GTA some people say three four whatever million that means there's an enormous number of kids and I think the, the data tells us that maybe one in five mm -hmm. uh, is at risk of developing a mental health illness right and you think about that population number and that number of kids and you think about the services that are available and, and we need to make sure that as many kids know about the service as possible um, and how to get into those services. Right. So one of the things that I wanna talk a little bit about just to, to sort of set the picture for folks is um, what it is that we do and, and, and mental health TO is a part of a bigger system. You know, and as you, as you mentioned, Lynn, there's uh, 26, 28 agencies in the city that deliver specialized mental health services. There's five indigenous organizations that we also partner with, and there's four 
uh, organizations that that um, that have a real specialty in working with new moms, um, and and all of that sits under what we call the lead agency model. Uh, and if folks uh, know about the health system, the you know the the structures called the LINs, which are local health integration networks, we're kind of like them in a lot of ways, but but a little bit different. And because our focus is children's mental health, and so what our job is. Um, primarily to do is to help folks and, and friends like Lynn and CDI um, to build ways for kids and families to get into services um, as easily as possible. Sometimes we, uh, you know, we support uh, ideas like shifting services to areas where we see where there's need, or we support an agency who's starting a program that, that folks want to hear about. Um, or we you know, bring people into the same room to have conversations on how we can all work together. Those are all parts of our job. Um, and I guess, <clears throat> now funny, because both Lynn and I weren't here at this point, but I guess about five years ago, um, there was a real big conversation in the city of Toronto and, and the agencies around how do, we, how do we build a front door? How do we build a front door to services so that it's easier for people to understand and to move from thinking about I might need help to having a conversation about what I feel like right now and then being matched up with services that really kind of suit those needs. And, and at that time, um, they thought a sort of an access point was a great idea. Uh, and that was where mental health TO was sort of born out of. Um, That's a real important role too, isn't it, David, in terms of being able to help families get matched with the right service and program because, um, you know, you tend to through your social networks or, or friends, you know, hear about a particular program and you think, oh, that would be great. Yeah. But uh, it's really important to have um, good screening and be able to have a really good match between the needs of uh, your child uh, or as a young person, um, you know, that you're getting the services that match what your needs are. So that's a, a real important function that that mental health TO has developed. Yeah, and if you think about, you know, if I were to ask, you know, people who are hopefully watching this, you know, what's your interpretation? What would mental health mean to you? Um, it might mean having trouble sleeping at night, or it might mean I'm developing some issues around uh, how I eat food, or it might mean something far more, you know, far more serious or impactful. Um, and so, what we've developed in the city are services to meet all of those needs. And so when we think about uh, mental health um, and we think about the programs that promote mental health, that goes everything from walking in off the street to say, hi, I might need to talk to someone and can I please have access to someone to inpatient or residential services where you actually go and you live in a place and, and receive treatment. And so between that and that, there's a huge number of services to meet the needs of the kids and the families that are, um, that are really presenting you know, for, or, or asking for help. So for, at CDI, you know, what are some of the programs that, that CDI offers? So um, we, we really are a specialty service provider. Um, so, we have kind of three main areas of our children's mental health services. Uh, we provide early intervention services, which are specialized treatment for young children um, that are experiencing uh, sometimes conflict at school uh, or in their childcare setting that are having uh, challenges in terms of their relationship at home, um, maybe have early involvement with um, the police and challenges around anger management, um, that sort of thing, and also may have uh, developmental disabilities. And so we have uh, specialized programs um, for those children and their families. Um, we also provide services uh, in the, for uh, families that have experienced family violence and children that have been affected by childhood sexual abuse. And so there's a lot of trauma-informed work with um, you know, families that, that need a lot of support. And then we also have um, unique uh, services um, through our Integra Learning Disabilities and Mental Health Services that are for uh, young people that have both a learning disability and a mental health challenge and um, have a, a wonderful summer camp that we usually run and 
going to be doing that virtually this summer, uh, but uh, provide uh, other kinds of programming that helps um, those kids who have processed information differently. And so um, we do provide our own intake services to those programs because some of them like our day treatment program for very young children, kindergartners, uh, first graders um, might come through a principal, for instance, of a school um, or um, through, um, for instance, the women's shelters where women are in, in a shelter and need services. Um, but we also, of course, receive um, intakes from, from you as well. And, you know, look at um, kind of those, those two, two ways of getting services in the system. And we do through our own intake, as I said, how important it is to help be sure that families and young, young people are getting matched with the appropriate service. So when someone does come to our door, um, we, we do spend time and get to know them and to um, try and understand what the challenges they, are, they have and um, you know, certainly welcome them to, to join uh, our, our services. But if it would be more appropriate for them to receive services elsewhere or after having received services from us, we also help them you know, find the other kinds of supports that they might need. Yeah, <clears throat> I think you know, that's great because I think helping folks understand what different programs are available is, is a huge part of the job, right? I mean, we have all of these amazing clinicians lined up, ready to go to deliver brilliant service, but oftentimes people have no idea how to get to those services. I was at a, <clears throat> pre-COVID, I was at a, a, a bit of a get together and just out of curiosity, I said, and this was, you know, with uh, people, my contemporaries and people younger, some with adult uh, kids, some with teenagers, some with young kids. And I said, if you recognized that there was something going on with your child and you needed to get service, what would you do? And I think almost half of them said, I would go to the hospital, yeah. right? So I can't tell you how many said, I, I would ask friends, I would start you know, digging into, into contacts and, and ask questions. Mm -hmm. There were very few who had a clear idea of how to actually get to service. And so for me, that, <clears throat> that really does sort of worry me when I think out of all of those millions of people and all of those kids that are looking for service or need service and they don't know how to get there. So we need to figure that out for them. And so part of what, um, part of what we did to, to help that out is with these agencies that we partner with, we thought one of the most important things for families to not have to do is to tell their story every single time they come into contact with someone where they're looking for service. Mm -hmm. And so MHTO worked with all of the agencies that we partner with um, and we got everyone to sign the data sharing agreement. And then we built what we call the portal which is really like a, in my head, it's this big tube that you know sort of goes from our offices to the agencies. And so when someone comes into, when someone calls, let's say they, they, they ring up MHTO and one of our clinicians answers the phone and they have a bit of a conversation and they, and they talk about you know, maybe why they feel like they need to, to or, or what they're calling for and, and uh, through a process called an assessment or, or um, it, which is really a series of questions to understand uh, the severity of the need. Um, that conversation then leads to, um, where are you in the city? Uh, have you been connected to an agency before? Um, do you know much about the mental health sector in general? And so they start narrowing down and through this conversation, and sometimes, you know, sometimes it's like a 10 minute call, sometimes it's an hour, right? It all depends on the person on the other end of the phone and the needs. Uh, and sometimes we have parents calling for kids. Sometimes we have teachers calling. Sometimes we have grandparents calling and sometimes we have kids calling. Um, but at the end of that process, what we do is we recognize that there is a need. So we say, yep, you know what? We think it will be a great idea for you to get connected to an agency. And then we say to those folks and those, uh, the kids on the line, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna press this button with your agreement and we're gonna send the information to the agency that's closest to your home or the agency that has the shortest wait list or the expertise that you need. And those are three really important things because what, what we don't wanna do is to send someone to an agency and then have them sit on a six month wait list to, to even talk to someone, mm -hmm. 
right? And so because we sort of look at the whole city as one big picture, we know what the wait times are in the agencies in Scarborough. We know what they are downtown and what they are in the east and the north. And so we think about that. And then we think about where the client lives. And, and often it's things like, what's the transit like? Mm -hmm. Do you have transportation to get to this agency? All of the, you know, what are the hours? Or do mom and dad work? Do you have to go after school? Like, so we, we, we sort of flush that out a little bit. And then we think about the expertise that they need. Uh, and if, you know, and if it's something that, uh, that a, an agency and only one agency has like CDI, then that becomes potentially the solution. So we press that button, the information goes to that agency without that client or without that family needing to talk about it again, right? And through our partnerships with all of our agencies, we've actually landed on that once that, once that file or once that information lands at the agency, then the agency agrees that within five days, they'll reach out to that client, have a conversation. And then within 10 days, they'll actually perform or complete the intake. So really what we're doing is we're eliminating a whole bunch of the red tape, a whole bunch of the, um, you know, the uncertainty around where to go. We're focusing in on the service, the geography and the wait times. And maybe I'll, I'll stop there. And well, and it seems to me too, from the from the family's perspective, it that I mean, it sounds like a long time waiting five days up to it five does. days to get a it call does. back, and then in terms of being seen. But it also means that during that time, you're not having to try and figure out what the 28 agencies are and be making 28 phone yeah. calls and uh, trying to find the right place, so that right. you have more of a chance of being able to get hooked up with the right organization that, and also that they've already um, received the, the information that you've personally chosen to share so that you don't have to repeat your story over again and you can get started. Um, so it's yeah. a, you know, it's an imperfect system in that, you know, uh, we, I think it's well known that, that um, child and youth mental health is under-resourced. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't have the capacity that we would like to. And uh, we've been working hard across, uh, you know, these partner agencies to build mental health TO and to, you know, become a system. Um, and so it's not perfect, but it is the way to navigate an imperfect system. And um, so it's a, um, it's a real resource that is so much better than trying to have to, you know, find and spend the time telling your story over and over again to multiple organizations until you can find a match. One of the things that we do is, and, and you know, you, you raise a really good point around that five days and it might feel like forever. Um, and so one of the things that we do is we say, if you feel like you need help quickly, I mean, there's two things. One is if you feel like you're uh, in danger or, to yourself or someone else, then we automatically connect you with emergency services, right? We recognize that there's a level, and I think folks appreciate that, that if there's a certain level that you're, mm -hmm. you're hitting that you do need help, we're going to recommend and we're going to facilitate that happening. The other is... And so you have connections through Mental Health TO with, yeah. with those crisis services. And, Absolutely. And yeah. can help that happen. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is, um, if it's not at that level, but you know, during that five days, or even the day of the conversation, you think, you know what, I need to go talk to someone. We have something called the walk-in clinics. And those are, and those are, we actually call them the what's up walk-in clinics. And actually we've sort of coined the term what's up talk-in these days, because of course no one's walking in anywhere. I mean, <laughs> a little bit more yesterday. Um, and it's, a, it's six clinics across the city that offer walk-in services. What does that mean, David, in terms of, of walk-in? So, so today it means a call to MHTO or to Mental Health Toronto and, uh, and a quick conversation. And uh, while you're on the phone and after we understand that, that this is what uh, may be of help, we will call one of the clinics that you live closest to and see if there's a clinician available. And if there is, we're gonna patch you right through to that clinician so that you actually have someone to talk to right then and there. Um, and if that clinician isn't available, then we'll go to the next clinic. You know, I mean, the, the beauty about um, 
not being able to walk anywhere is that everything's virtual. Mm -hmm. So really, if you're sitting in Scarborough, does it matter that you're talking to someone in Etobicoke? No. If they've got the skills and they've got the, the time and they're a clinician that's open and available, then let's make that connection. We try to do it so that, you know, after or post COVID, <laughs> if there's such a thing, um, that you would be as close to that walking clinic if you needed it. So I think really what, you know, what ends up happening is that we have a bunch of different ways to support kids and families, depending on what it is that they need at that moment. And I think that this is really timely, of course, because we know that um, this is a stressful time. You and I, you know, as we were getting ready for this, we're talking mm -hmm. about how, um, how close emotions are to the surface uh, because of, of the stress and yeah. Uh, for children and youth, um, you know, we know that uh, this can be a lonely time in terms of being, uh, you know, isolated from friends and from family and certainly big changes in routine and, and the dynamics of, of family life in terms of being cut off from people or having, um, you know, additional people move into your house, you know, all, all kinds of things, as well as, um, you know, very scary situations with you know, family members or friends that are ill. And uh, so it's uh, a time and, and, you know, we're seeing in terms of um, the, the discussions that we're having with families that, you know, some kids are, are struggling and others are, you know, away from the, the routines of school and whatever, or can kind of, you know, doing okay. okay. So, you know, and, and <clears throat> um, children are resilient. Um, but at the same, and, and adults are as well, but at the same time, this is a very stressful time. And um, so we, we are starting, you know, we, we have continually as we've been opened and our other sister agencies have as well continued to see um, people that needed service and are, are struggling. And I think that as this goes on uh, and, and then we start to move back into some more routines that yeah. uh, you know, we're certainly um, expecting to see and anticipating the need for both, as you said, David, you know, this kind of immediate access to service. And that's yeah. that's what walk-in clinics are, is to yeah. get in and see somebody right away and yeah. uh, get that support. And for some people that, and young people that can, you know, meet their needs. And for others, um, you know, it's the beginning of a process of having more intensive kinds of treatment. Yeah, you know, some of the data that's coming out uh, around uh, how kids are, are doing at home is quite interesting, right? So the rates of bullying have dropped enormously, but the rate, you know, it, and it makes sense, right? Mm -hmm. But the rates of anxiety have gone through the roof, right? right. And so to your point, Lynn, I think, you know, families are, are going through um, changes and shifts and, and circumstances that we've never had to go through before, right? And so if, uh, you know, if, uh, if mom or dad has lost their job because of this, or if there is, you know, a real serious illness or a death in the family, all of that compounds when you have kids who really can't go anywhere, right? Their social networks have been severed. They can't run outside and play with their friends. So, yeah. you know, then it becomes screen time is the only connection. And that, you know, that comes with its, you know, good and bad. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, part of what we're seeing is, you um, at the MHTO line is, is parents calling just to, sometimes just to get some reassurance yeah. um, around, you know, what is happening and whether it is okay. And, and mm -hmm. you know, we, if, I look at the, if I look at the number of kids that we refer out, I would say probably double that is the number of calls we get. And so really it is, there's a large number of people out there who are just feeling not great about what they're experiencing with their kids and they need, they need a bit of reassurance, right? right. Yeah. And I think this has also been a stressful time for young children who, um, you know, have lost the routine of childcare and have parents um, some sometimes who are trying to work at home. And so, you know, their parents are in the house, but not available to them. And that can be very uh, confusing for young kids and distressing. And uh, so, yeah. and, and being able, uh, you know, the, the services that we provide uh, are kind of labeled child and youth mental health, but uh, they're also services that serve the whole family. And so yeah. sometimes, you know, it's uh, supports that we can provide that the parents who are the biggest resource for their own children um, 
of coaching and other kinds of things to be able to help support their their, their kids. Yeah, I, you know, it, it's, uh, I think most agencies will agree, all agencies will agree that it's not, it, it's not just one person that is there for help, it's the whole unit, right? right? And, and whatever that looks like. Um, you know, in the, in the walk-in clinics, the age range for that is actually all the way up to 29. And so often we'll get, um, we'll get new families, right, coming in who are experiencing uh, something that they, that they need some help with. Or um, we'll get parents with really little kids, right, who aren't, you know, who are over 29 and they're coming and dropping their kids off at the door to say, like, you know, uh, they've expressed a need for some help. Now, of course, you can't do that now because it's all virtual. Uh, and that presents its own complexities when you re when you think about it. You know, there's lots of kids out there who are um, uh, who would benefit from coming to a, a walk-in clinic, but can't because of the circumstances. And so, the, the MHTO mechanism is a great way for them to get connected to a clinician uh, and still be at home. Okay. So I'm wondering if uh, if we've got some questions on online that we could start taking a look at. Did you have something you wanted to say? No, I was, I was going to, what I wanted to do, but maybe before we, we throw the questions up is I wanted okay. to put up on the screen, um, you know, you and I have been yep. talking for almost a half an hour <laughs> and we haven't mentioned how to actually call the number yet, right? Oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> so let's, let's put that up on the screen and then underneath of it is a list of all of the agencies in the city that we actually, um, that are, that are part of this network. Okay. And so you may recognize share, some. Share your slide. You may, and you may not recognize some. Uh, so I'm gonna share that and then I'm gonna go slideshow uh, from beginning. There now, hopefully people will see the mental health TO. Yep. And then we're gonna go into, there we go. So some of those agencies, um, and oh look, there's one Child Development Institute <laughs> that's <laughs> highlighted. Um, some of these agencies are very small and some of them are really big, right? So Sick Kids Center for Community Mental Health, that's a really big organization. CDI is a big organization. And then you've got very small uh, sort of uh, community-based organizations like Sancta Maria or Arabon. Um, uh, uh, and then you've got other ones that are sort of uh, span across the city like Strides Toronto or Luminous. Uh, those are agencies that uh, that have recently merged and have um, become much larger with much larger catchments. And and I'll flip to the last slide there, and we may, you know, it's probably worth reviewing it um, again before the end of this. But I'll just I'll put up uh, the different ways that we can communicate. Uh, and so we have a we have a great uh, presence on Instagram, and of course here we are on Facebook on on CDI's page, but we have a we have a presence on Facebook and Twitter. Uh, and then, of course, there's the, the mental health website as well that you can go to and, uh, and get some more information. Great. And at the end of this presentation, we'll provide the, the contact information for uh, CDI as well, um, because if, if people do know that this is that CDI is where they, um, they think is the best match, mm -hmm. you know, we certainly do our own intake. But uh, Again, really wanted to let people know that mental health TO is a, a really good way to uh, have get a good screening, have access to immediate services, because it's one of the things that CDI doesn't have. We've yeah. concentrated our resources on uh, these specialty programs that we deliver, and we're not one of the What's Up Walk-In uh, clinic sites. We don't have immediate um, access. Uh, so those are the kinds of things that, you know, some of our sister agencies have um, those resources available. So it's an important part to, to realize that we're all part of a network together. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think a, a really important piece of this is if you're unsure, you know, calling MHTO connects you with a clinician who will, who knows better than anyone in the city what the services are and where they're offered. And so, you know, it, that matching it, piece is important. Right. And it, it also allows us to be responsive as a system to uh, particular family needs or desires so that if um, a family uh, is has an indigenous background and would yeah. like to work with uh, an indigenous counselor, uh, we can, you know, through mental health TO make those connections as the same, um, some of our organizations um, are focused on 
the black community and so uh, and other you know specialties uh, organizations that have capacity not only clinically but in terms of the, the communities and populations that they serve so it's a, a really good way to be able to um, tap into the the diversity that um, is across the whole system available yep yeah, you're right there's you know there are when we talk about mental health I think wellness is a part of mental health that we don't uh, necessarily lump in because we often think of mental health as a, as a clinical service and only a clinical service, but there is wellness is that, that, that is a huge part of that, right? And so I think about some of the newcomer programs that are out there, um, you know, that, that really sort of help build community uh, and, and, you know, facilitate better communication between parents and kids and, and all of that stuff that, that really does build for healthier communities. And then you can go to the other end where, you know, there are, there are agencies that we can connect you with that, that have expertise in addictions or have expertise in human trafficking um, or eating disorders, right? I mean, so, you know, it is, I have to, when I get together with my colleagues from across the province, I often sort of sit back with a little smugness sometimes because I think, you know, we are truly blessed with uh, resources in Toronto uh, for, the, for the folks who live in Toronto that aren't necessarily available in other places in the province. And so I think it's, it's important to recognize that, that we have this resource and, uh, and to, to use it wisely, uh, but to make sure that people can get to it. And so maybe I'll, uh, I'll take this down and then we can, uh, we can start answering some questions if folks have questions. Great. So I, I do want to, um, okay, so the first question. Um, an elementary school teacher in Toronto and nervous about students um, that are going to have difficulties this summer and might not uh, be able to be, get those addressed until they re return to school in the fall or later, depending on when school starts. And so what specific um, services or resources would you suggest that teachers have ready to tell parents uh, about when they begin to see their students again? That's a good question. And, and I, you know, I think you're right. I think there will be uh, things that emerge over the summer. One of the, one of the really great things that we do is um, we try to partner with as many um, many folks who are outside of children's mental health as possible. And that includes the school boards. Uh, and so through the social work programs, they are very well aware of MHTO. I think it's a great resource. I think the walk-ins are a great resource uh, to, to be ready. So with. And, I, and I think that um, in, in terms of the teachers, while our services, and I can speak to, uh, I have the, the benefit of having one of my intake workers on, uh, on the text uh, as a resource. And, and um, she's pointing out to me that although, you know, we're really set up for um, in many ways, you know, for, for, for young people or, or families to approach our intake, if the teacher were to approach uh, and come to intake or to mental health TO and ask for some resources to use with their own students, um, that's certainly something that, that we could do. Great. So question number two, and, and you know what, I love this question because you're talking to two people who, uh, who have a long history in uh, technology enabled care. And so the question is due to the nature of COVID-19, in-person sessions are no longer available for obvious reasons. Yep. Uh, do you find online and phone sessions and or help to be as effective for children as in-person? That's a great question. And I think uh, if we approach it this way, um, services over technology are as good as in person, if in person isn't available, and that's a bit of a that's a bit of a tricky way to say it. But I think uh, there's been a lot of research. There's been a lot of work to develop skill sets for delivering uh, care over technology. It's not it, it's not the same necessarily as being in person. There are different, you know, when, when you think about sitting across from someone, there are there are cues that you get from the person you're sitting across. Those sometimes aren't there when you're when you're uh, over video, they're certainly not there when they're over the phone. So it's a different skill set, um, but it is effective. And I think that given the circumstances that we're in, um, 
it is something that I think we should be uh, promoting as a way to connect with clinicians. Absolutely. It's one of the things that we're doing at CDI as we're, we've kind of pivoted our services and uh, first delivered mostly by phone. And then as we've you know, kind of gotten our video capacity up and, and running that we're evaluating the services as we're delivering them. And I know that many of our uh, sister organizations are, but there is, as, as you were saying, David, in terms of telepsychiatry and other kinds of um, services that have been offered for you know, over a decade now, yeah. quite good research that shows that they can be as effective. Yeah, one of the programs that I, that I didn't mention earlier, and I actually, this question prompted it, is around access to psychiatry. Um, it's a pretty scarce resource, and child and adolescent psychiatry is even more rare. Um, but what we did is we partnered with Sick Kids Hospital uh, to provide access to psychiatry uh, for the City of Toronto over video conferencing. And that may that may feel like a bit of a, well, why would you do it? Because you live in the city. But in fact, if you go back to our conversation a little while ago around how folks get to uh, agencies and you know the use of transit and uh, work schedules and all of those things. And so we recognize that uh, access to psychiatry has been something that's been available over video conferencing to rural and remote communities for a long time. And it's very successful. Both Lynn and I worked in that area at one time together outside of this. Um, and so what we're doing is we're piloting this in, in the city of Toronto to see if there is um, if there's uptake and if there's usage that would support us keeping this kind of a program going uh, indefinitely. And, and really, so connecting to an agency through MHTO as part of that, uh, as part of the work that would happen, and I'm not talking about the walk-in services, I'm talking about the ongoing services. Um, if there's if there's a recognition that psychiatry would be beneficial as part of the part of the plan, then that agency has uh, the ability to reach out to us at MHTO, and we will make the connection for a video conference to a child and adolescent psychiatrist at the hospital for sick children, uh, and and then you have that resource available to you as well. So in, in terms of the effectiveness, we, you know, the feedback that we CDI is getting from the, the clients that we're serving is that they're finding it, it is meeting their needs um, in positive ways. And also that um, having that, that resource also helps uh, families be able to connect to other things that they may need in the community in terms of, um, for instance, food or other things that uh, are challenges in the circumstances. Someone wants me to share the list again. So that means that I'm going to have to try my hand at technology again. That could be a bit scary here. Just give me one second and I'm sure that I will be able to do this. No problem. How's that? And let me just get rid of this and we'll go. There we go. So this is the list of, of the various partner sister organizations that, that are available in the, the 1-800 number, 866 number. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and if you, you know, if you look at the list of uh, organizations, um, you know, the, it really does cover the whole city, right? So mm -hmm. I think about the downtown core uh, and there, there, it feels like there are a lot of agencies situated in the downtown core, but in, in fact, those agencies have, um, they have uh, reach across the entire city. And right. then there are agencies like George Hole, who really is uh, sort of located in the west end of the city. Uh, and that's where their catchment is focused. Um, Yorktown is sort of up in the Eglinton and Avenue Road, uh, Allen, that sort of area. Youthdale is downtown, Sancta Maria is downtown. And then we have hospitals as well, because I don't know if folks know that uh, there is mental health programming that takes place out of hospitals as well. And so uh, as part of our MHTO, we, we support North York General, we support sick kids, we support Scarborough uh, in, some of their, um, in some of their mental health programming as a way in. So there's some uh, questions about the timelines in place for reopening in-person services. So um, 
as we look at the variety of different providers, there have been some uh, providers that have uh, been serving, for instance, uh, kids that are living on the street, um, uh, residential treatment programs, uh, crisis services that have continued to uh, be provided in person. And all of the agencies now are working on their own as well as kind of sharing resources in terms of uh, returning to the workplace. So uh, in terms of uh, those, uh, I can only speak for CDI in terms of the, the detail, but we're prioritizing um, services from what we're hearing from the families that we're working with and what we're hearing from the wait list around what our, uh, where the greatest pressure is uh, in terms of face-to-face -face services and prioritizing those and are expecting that we'll be able in the next um, couple of weeks to be able to uh, start to, um, to gradually reopen our services. Uh, we're going to be piloting in two of our offices um, because of course there's, anyway, as anybody would know, lots of logistics to sort out <laughs> in terms of, of doing this. And, uh, <coughs> excuse me. Um, so, you know, the, the safety of our clients is, is paramount in terms of, um, you know, being able to do that as well as our staff. And uh, so. So there's another, another question here and it's, um... And it's about uh, who can actually refer to uh, MHTO, and it's a really good question. I think uh, initially this was set up for families and kids, um, but we quickly quickly realized that there are um, a multitude of uh, other professions out there who intersect with children and mental health, and that they need access to this. So I think about teachers, um, about uh, family physicians because believe it or not family physicians often have a very hard time uh, accessing mental health services they're experts in medicine but mental health is a whole other area and children's mental health becomes even more difficult uh, and so we actually partner with physicians uh, so that they can call mhto and get access as well so anyone really that has that connection with kids um, and they recognize that there's a problem they can call and have a conversation Often what it means is um, talking about uh, whether or not, um, you know, they would feel comfortable leaving a number that we could call to get in touch with a family or an individual around uh, potentially talking about service. Um, so, but yeah, absolutely, we're able to, uh, we're able to take calls uh, and facilitate uh, some connections from folks who aren't necessarily parents. And uh, in in Ontario, uh, mental health services are a voluntary service, and so um, you know while we can um, you know take take referrals, in the end you know we make every e effort to engage with families, but it's uh, and and with young people, and in yeah. in the end, however, these are voluntary services, and so uh, you know it's important uh, to be able to. Um, to try and build those connections with families and young people. And often a teacher or another service provider can, can be that link, um, but it's not something that you can just hand off and necessarily make it happen. So no, it's- no. Yeah, it's a bit of a complex system sometimes, unfortunately. Yeah. But I think, you know, single points of entry eliminate a lot of that clutter and a lot of that confusion. And so, um, I think we're really happy that this is this is available to people in Toronto. I think our agencies are really happy that we have this uh, this uh, way of, of facilitating kids getting to service. Um, and I would encourage the folks who are uh, watching to uh, to talk about it with friends and and uh, family. And if there is a need, to absolutely give us a call. Great. Um, so. I, I think we can probably kind of wrap things up. Um, so I thank, thank you very much, David. This has been My great to, to chat about. Uh, there's a lot of work that's gone into uh, building the coalition to uh, have Mental Health TO um, be up and running. And we're working hard to uh, begin to raise the profile of Mental Health TO so that, um, that families are aware of it. Uh, and, and that young people themselves can, of course, make those referrals too. 
So we're really glad that you've joined us this evening. And I want to remind you that um, Ask CDI will have another uh, session. We'd like to invite you to join us in two weeks on July the 9th uh, for our next session. And uh, I'd like to thank you very much, David, for spending this time with me. It's my pleasure. I hope that we were able to uh, give some good information and to and to talk a bit about a service that is pretty close to my heart. And I think uh, uh, I thank you for allowing me to do that, Lynn. It's been great. Thanks. Been great. Take care, everyone. Okay. Bye.